Test one, two, test one, two. Hey, is it working at home now, people? I'm getting a thumbs up. All right, well, I'm yeah. glad I took a moment to do that because that would be very frustrating to be at home and not hear, just see my mouth moving. I would be ignored, you're right. <laughs> I think I'd sign out real quickly. All right, so I think we're good. We're talking the why. Jeremiah, I did this whole big buildup that you all missed at home of all the evils that are going around Jeremiah. So Jeremiah's ignored, nobody's listening to him, there's evils going on, and it's very common to say why. Why, why, why? And uh, not last week, but the week before, I was approached by somebody who had been hurt by the church, and they said, why? Why did this happen, right? Why did this happen? We ask this all the time, why? Why, if we have a good God, is there evil in this world? That problem is called a theodicy. That problem in, in, is called a theodicy, which comes from theos and deka. Theos means God, like theology, right? Theos means God, and, and dika means justice. So theodicy is asking God, where is the justice? Where is your power when I'm in over, our, in over my head? So theodicy presents us with this unanswerable riddle. God may be powerful and good if there's no evil in the world, but if there's evil, how can God be powerful and good? God may be good, and there may be evil, but God is not powerful. You see how the, this riddle can allow for two, but it can't allow for the third. And, then, and God may be powerful, and there may be evil if God is not good. But how can God be powerful and good and for evil to exist in the world? Of these three elements, goodness, power, and evil, skeptics say that two together can be affirmed, but in no logical way can all three hold together. And that's where we left off last week. Note, start here. <laughs> That's why it says start here. That's where we left off last week. So how can we respond? How can we respond to those who say there is no God because there's evil in the world. And if God is good and powerful, there cannot be evil. Right? This is the problem of theodicy. So first, we need to acknowledge God's goodness. God is good all the time, right? That is a fundamental truth, a biblical truth that is portrayed from Genesis to Revelation over and over again. The Bible defines God's goodness in two ways, with his character and with his actions, with who he is and what he does. So Psalm 119, verse 68, captures both when it says, you are good and you do what is good. See, the first half of this verse describes God's character. God isn't an angry judge. God isn't a mean ogre. God is good. And then the second half points us to God's actions. God doesn't do evil. He isn't malicious or sinister. God redeems. God restores. God does good. God hears our, our cries of lament and says, I don't condemn you. I don't belittle you. I don't scorn you or shame you. Seeing, I have seen. Hearing, I have heard. Exodus chapter 3. God calls to the people of the Israelites, and Exodus, 
I know you learned in Sunday school, Exodus is about the Israelites exiting Egypt, but that's not really what the book is about. That is a true important fact of the book, but Exodus is about God coming close to his people. Exodus is about God coming close to his people, seeing I have seen, hearing I have heard your cries. And God fixes it for his people, Israel, by coming to live in their midst. That's why half of the book of Exodus is about the tabernacle, the part we never talk about in Sunday school, the part that we like to lop off and ignore, because after all, it's repeated twice. And if it's repeated twice, it can't be that important. It's got to be like, duh, if it's repeated twice, it is important, right? That's what I always tell the confirmation kids. If I say it three times in class, you can guarantee it's going to be on the exam. If I say it three times in class, it's going to be on the exam. And if God is going to say it twice in Exodus, this is how you're going to build the tabernacle. And then this is how they built the tabernacle. My gosh darn tootin', the tabernacle's important because that provides a way for God to live in the midst of his people, the kavod Yahweh to exist in the midst of his people with one fourth of the people to the north and one fourth to the south, one fourth to the east, one fourth to the west. God is in the midst of his people. He does what is good. He is good. He does what is good. And yet sometimes life stinks. There's no other way to put it. It just stinks. How did I find myself here? But God is still good. And God still does good. When we say this, we see Jesus embracing the lepers. Now, that is a story that has had dramatic influence since the pandemic. I was a taken back. The first time I taught about the lepers to kids after the pandemic, because they knew what it was meant to be quarantined. It meant something to the kids. And I bet it means something to you. After all, there's nothing like being locked in your house for all of October of 2020. When you dream of going into Walmart or IV, what joy it would bring to be in the aisles. Right? Drool coming out my mouth. <laughs> and I'm serious. <laughs> And I'm, I am serious. I really wanted to, to not have to do a pickup and have them put it in my trunk and have no social interaction whatsoever. And I remind myself of that when I'm frustrated that somebody is blocking my aisle and I can't get through. I can wait. God is still good. He embraces. Jesus embraces the lepers. Now, Leprosy is a disease that still exists today. It is not cured. It is managed. It is managed even with all of our modern day medical science and knowledge. We can manage it so the person who has leprosy is no longer contagious. But in Jesus' day, they were. And so once you were confirmed to have leprosy, you were kicked out of your community. You had to live outside the village. You had to carry bells with you so that you would ring like a dog so people would know to run away from you. You had to shout, unclean, 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 anytime you came around people. Now, we talked about the psychological effects of being quarantined. Imagine the psychological effects if you had to yell at everybody that you were unclean. You had to tell everybody to stay away from you. And Jesus touches them. 
God does what is good. He gets down on his hands and knees and he washes the disciples' feet. Feet that are dusty and dirty. He's on his hands and knees and cleans them. Now, at the spring confirmation trip, every time we go to St. Paul, I do a foot washing of all the disciples. I get on my hands and knees, and I wash them. And I learned a very valuable lesson over the years, that if we stay at a church and they play basketball before we do the foot washing, it's going to be a very different experience for me than when we stay at a hotel and they go swimming before we do the foot washing. It's a very different experience. Yes. <laughs> okay. So there are churches that do that. Uh, I, we could not pull that off. We're not going to start that. That's good. My dad talks about when he was a kid, they did foot washing on Monday, Thursday as part of the service as well. Um, Jesus is on his hands. Jesus, God, is on his hands and knees washing the disciples' feet. We trust God's goodness when we hear Jesus describing a shepherd who leaves the 99 to go find the one lost sheep or heartbroken father who never stops yearning for the return, return of his son. <laughs> Second, in the face of doubters, God's word itself attests that God is powerful. And third, suffering is real. Let's not sugarcoat it. The Bible doesn't. Suffering isn't an illusion. Affliction is real. It disrupts God's good creation. And there is no link between your faith and suffering in your life. You can have strong faith and you can have strong suffering which is counter to what some Christians say. That's why I'm trying to make this point very clear. I've had people join our congregation because their previous pastor told them they had little faith because of the sickness and suffering in their life. And they resigned that congregation and began to look for a new church several years after. They stayed away from church for a while because they couldn't endure the suffering and the blame on their level of faith. Faith and suffering are not an equation. You can have great faith and great suffering. It disrupts God's good creation. Sin runs amok in this world and sometimes it's a direct result of what we do, and other times it is not. It disrupts God's good creation. Suffering didn't exist before the fall, and we will not experience suffering when Christ returns. God is good. God is powerful. Evil is real. We can attest to all three being true. These three ideas constitute Jeremiah's worldview. So what does Jeremiah say about theodicy? He says that theodicy is an irrelevant exercise. A chasing after wind. We can't explain God's actions. Because we're not God. God is God and I am not. We don't have access to the heavenly court. And we can't see the whole picture. 
This is oftentimes when I'm counseling people that'll end up sharing two stories if it's fitting and proper and right. And one goes back to just after I was ordained, uh, my family and the Zimmermans went out to a fish fry. Um, I love fried fish. Carol Zimmerman loves fried fish. We said, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And we finally did it. We went to the catfish place in Nichols, which I don't think is open anymore. Right? Yeah, it's not open anymore. And it was a great buffet. And we had a great time that night. But here's the story that sticks out. Karen and I have always encouraged our kids to try lots of foods and just, and just eat it and see what it's like. And so that night on the buffet, there was something that Grace and Emma didn't know what it was. And they said, what's this? And I said, I don't know. Try it and see if you like it. Yeah, that was a lie. I knew that it was. <laughs> so Grace and Emma, thank you, Grace and Emma, put it on their plate and they went and they sat at the table and the waitress says, do you know what you're going to eat? And they said, no. I said, very quickly, but they're willing to try it. <laughs> the waitress turned and walked away. <laughs> and, and that that night, Grace and Emma both tried frog legs, right? A delicatessen, not many people serve fried legs that day. They both said they liked it. They said it tastes like, <laughs> right? This is a true story. Emma's over there, she's nodding her head. You remember this? Right, I tell this story, I tell this story often. And here's the reason why I tell the story. I was on the phone telling my dad, just like I told all you, and isn't this great? They tried frog legs. And my dad then said, oh, I love frog legs. I said, what do you mean you love frog legs? You have never, never once served us frog legs. And he he's said, you're right. But my dad and I, we used to go down to the Mackinac River and we'd gig up some frogs, go home, fry them up in butter. We did it all the time. Well, I knew where my dad lived. I knew where the Mackinac River was. And I guess he and my grandpa did this all the time, but I had no idea. I had no earthly idea until that moment that my dad, who I love and adore and I spent a lot of time with, ate frog legs. So if I don't know that about my earthly father, why in the world do I think I should know everything about my heavenly father, my creator who created me? It's illogical to think that the creation would know everything about the creator. And if I don't know everything about my dad, and I don't, I'm still learning stuff today, then how can I expect to know everything about my heavenly father? We're not God. God is God, and I am not. So I'll read my Bible, and I'll read it a lot. We don't have access to the heavenly court. We can't see the whole picture. And here I'll tell a story sometimes. We can't see the whole picture. I will uh, tell a story of a uh, somebody who does cross stitch, right? I did cross stitch. Uh, I learned because Kara had to give a speech the next day. We went to Les Mis. We got back to our dorm rooms. It was midnight. And I said, all right, I'm going to bed. And she said, well, I don't have my speech done or my visual aids. So I was thinking, why don't you work on my visual aids while I write my speech? And I said, okay, what's your, and it was a how-to speech. She was going to teach how to cross stitch. And I said, I don't know how to cross stitch. And I was, I had to make large, uh, I took poster board and made three inch by three inch holes and then took a pencil, which I taped yarn onto, and then began to cross stitch to make her visual aids. So she would have a pre and a post visual aid, some simple design that I came up with that night. So anyway, I learned cross stitch. If you ever look at the back of cross stitch, don't look at the back of my cross stitch. Marilyn Pates, don't look at the back of hers either because hers will make you sick and you'll never want to cross stitch ever again because her front looks like her back. Her back looks like her front. I don't know how she does it. She is so neat. 
I'm so messy, yarn from here to here to there, right? When we look at what's going on in the world, we look from the back side of the cross stitch. But God sees it from the front side. He sees the connections and the moves that we can't even begin to fathom. And how it's going to become important in our lives as our lives unfolds down the road. We can't see the whole picture. We don't know everything that is going on. Even though I like to think I know all that's going on, I do, I confess that. I like to think I know everything, but we don't. Here's the third story that I'll sometimes share in, in counseling. It's a made up story of two angels, but it teaches an important point, right? Two angels are walking across God's country, Iowa, and uh, they're on a country road. If you grew up in Illinois, you can say Illinois. <laughs> you walk it across the country road and he comes to the first farmhouse so the two angels need a place to stay for the night so they knock on the door the farmer invites them in shows them a bed in the basement the two angels have a good night's rest and the one sees a hole in the wall so he zaps it so that hole is now fixed they have breakfast with the farmer and his wife and then they take off walking down the road and night falls again, they find another farmhouse, they knock on the door, and the farmer and his wife invite the two angels in, and they give them their bed, while the farmer and his wife sleep somewhere else in the house. And in the morning, the two angels wake to find the farmer and his wife weeping at the table. For in the night, their only cow had died, and they have no idea how they're going to get milk anymore. And the one angel says to the other angel, now at the first house where they treated us nice, you zapped and you fixed the hole in the wall. But at the second house where they treated us exorbitantly well, you did absolutely nothing. And the other angel says, that's not true. I stayed up the whole night pleading with the angel of death that he would not take the farmer's wife. And the angel of death agreed to take the cow instead. So I saved the farmer, his wife. And in that first house, when I zapped the wall, they'll never find the gold that was hidden in that hole. Right? See, things aren't always as we think they are. And we as the created, we the creation, need to humble ourselves and say, God is God, I am not. I don't know all that's going on. I don't know why God is allowing this suffering in my life. Is it for my good? Is it for the good of someone else? I don't know. And trust me, when I walk through suffering, I have to repeat that this to myself over and over and over again, because we are people who want, we want them now. We are, whether you watch it or not, a TikTok society. We want it now. McDonald's isn't fast enough. They made me wait in too long of a line. Why can't they be more like Chick-fil-A and get me through a little faster? We want it now. We don't want to kill and pluck our own chicken. We want it served to our house, fully cooked and ready to eat. We want it now. We want answers. And many times in counseling, I will say, I can't answer why. But if you change one letter, we can always answer who. Who is your God? Jesus. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father sent the Son to live and to die and to rise again. And the Son sent the Spirit to be with you, to bring you the truth so that you would understand because by your own reason, you cannot understand. The Spirit has brought you the faith to believe in the Son that the Father sent. Who is in your life? Who desires good for you? That we can answer. We see, the reality is we don't need answers. That's a trick of the devil. We think we need answers. We think we need justice. 
But what we need is Jesus. All you need is Jesus. Anything else, you're being fooled by the world, your sinful flesh, or the devil. Jesus doesn't call us to understand. Jesus doesn't give us a test. And when we pass the test, we get our license to be a Christian. That when we write a dissertation for five years, somebody will eventually send an email and says, this person can graduate now. No, it doesn't happen that way, right? right. It doesn't happen that way when it comes to our faith. Because it's not about understanding. It's not about licensure. It's not about an email with words that you're so excited to see. So it's time to let go of unsolvable questions and learn to lament. We must find ways to express our sadness about once what once was is no longer, and will never be again. You know, those of you with a, uh, the last child graduating preschool and going into kindergarten, you'll never have a preschooler again. You know that. But this you don't always know. It never stops. It never stops when you have kids. Because there's always a change that is coming at every stage, at every place. And so what once was, is no longer, and will never be again. There will never be another time that I will have all five kids in my house on a snow day where they don't have to go to school and I can make a big breakfast. They could play in the snow outside. We could play a board game in the afternoon. That will never be again. Now, there are other joys like I hear and I'm about to experience this new joy of something called a specifically a granddaughter. I know a lot about pink and bows and lace and ribbons. We used to do three loads of pink a week. I know a lot. <laughs> right? right, you would think, knowing Kara and pink's her favorite, you would think it would be her, but no, that was just the girls. Because you know, it's not one outfit per day. <laughs> it's not and with girls who like to dress up it's not two outfits a day <laughs> so the book of psalms really becomes the ultimate example for us and it's that book and there are psalms where we just like to skip over them but there are books there are there are chapters in the book of psalms that help us to express the raw experiences of life. They cry out, how long, O oh Lord? How long? Where is God? Why? Are you asleep, God? Wake up. Listen. I mean, look at all those examples there, and that's just a, a foretaste of the feast that is to come in the book of Psalms when it comes to laments. Psalms rejects a fake, pretentious faith and affirms that suffering is real. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. Really? Wouldn't it be amazing if we could get to the place where we could say things like, how are you today? I've had better days, but I'm making it. I'm putting one foot in front of the other. I'm still here standing. The suffering that's going on in my life is still there, but I'm here standing. I'm doing what I need to do. And I'm doing it the best that I can do during this time. 
See, we never get past sorrow. We see this when it comes to the death of a loved one. I don't know this yet, but with the death of a spouse, it's a sorrow that's always there. I talk to many of our members. They share what it's like to continue on without the spouse. To say, boy, I wish Don was here. He'd want to know this. Jan Binker brings it up to me all the time, and I'm thankful she does. We should not hide that. We should not sequester that to a hidden place of our heart. Because we all want to know. Because Mother's Day is coming and Denise Holiday is not going to be able to go over and have ice cream with her mom. And it's good to be able to say that. And as many of you know, my mom is not doing well. She's stable. She's forgetful. She's becoming argumentative this past week. She did not want dialysis. She told my dad, just let her die. Which is not easy for my dad to hear. But that's the stage that we're in with my mom. And now my mother-in-law has been battling stage four lung cancer since January of 2016 is in the hospital and has uh, fractured vertebrae, L1 and L4 or 5. And they're doing a biopsy on Monday of her bone to see is it cancer or is it infection? So that we know whether she will have radiation or whether she will have IV antibiotics for six to eight weeks and has to move into a nursing home in Florida. The amount of time that this has consumed for Kara this past week of being the encourager motivator to her sister who is first time dealing with taking care of her mom medically has been a big burden. What a joy it has been as well that Kara knows how to maneuver our medical system and she was able to get to the lawyer and get the proper paperwork and get UIHC connected to Advent Health in Florida so that they can see all the records simultaneously, was able to talk to the cancer doctor here so that they could tell the doctor down there what to do with the biopsy once they get it. Whether it all worked like they want, that's to remain to be seen, but this is reality. This is real life. Suffering happens. I don't know all of your suffering. You don't know all of my suffering. But we know we're suffering together. For when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And we are the body of Christ. Christ is the head. We are his body. And so we're here beginning to learn how to lament. And the first stage, complain. <laughs> I'm pretty good at that. <laughs> I don't know about you. I can complain. So specifically, complain to God. So the steps of, of lament are complain, appeal, remind, express, and seek. Complain to God. We need to be ourselves to succeed in any relationship. This means the curtain is pulled away and the one hiding behind is exposed. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, Taylor Swift has it right. It's me, I'm the problem. And you all can tell Claire that I finally said it in Bible study. <laughs> Because I told her the other day I was going, or I told her last week I was going to do this. And immediately after church, she said, what the hell when you said Taylor Swift? I said, I didn't get that far. <laughs> if you know in her recent song, Anti-Hero, that's the refrain. It's me, it's me, I'm the problem. It's okay if you don't. You might be better off if you don't. <laughs> Nevertheless, Taylor is making her billions. And that was with the B. Because <laughs> I'm sure it's beyond millions. 
the amount of money that my own daughter has spent on Taylor Swift stuff, multiplied times the millions of others, the, Taylor Swift has got to have more money than, well, we would used to say more money than Solomon, right? But those are the kind of phrases we don't use in our work. We've stopped using those biblical references. Why? Because people don't know them. If you don't know the Bible, you can't make them. And if you make them and don't know the Bible, you don't know what they mean. So we complain to God. Who here thinks they can complain to God? Think you can do that? No, some of you can't. The Bible tells you you can. The Bible tells you you should. And what I would tell you in counseling is God is bigger than you are, right? VeggieTales got this right so long ago. God is bigger than the boogeyman. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's the song. God is bigger than the boogeyman. So God can take your complaints. An appeal to God's love. Notice this isn't only complain to God but it's appeal to his love, appeal to his character. God is good all the time. Appeal to his character. Trust his mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. What do you deserve? Death, hell, and damnation. You're not getting it. Because of Jesus. Splachnizomai. That's the Greek word for compassion. It means coming from the guts. Right? We talk about my heart. Oh, my heart yearns for you. The Bible never says that. The heart is the place of evil. Heart is the place of evil. But your guts, that's the place, that's the place of compassion. We get it when we say stuff like, oh, that makes my stomach hurt, right? When something that is so sad or so bad that has happened, we'll say, oh, that makes my stomach hurt. I can't believe that just happened, right? That's that idea of compassion. And Jesus has deep compassion. Where he heals the blind. He gives hearing to the deaf. He makes the lame walk. And those lepers, he, killed, he heals a disease that is still incurable today. Appeal to God's love. Remind God of his promises. Little kids love to do this. Mom and dad, you said, you said, well, we get to do it to God too. God, you said, you said all my sins would be forgiven. You said they would be removed as far as the east is from the west. You said, God, I'm trusting your promises. I'm trusting it's true. So we express trust in God and his wisdom and the things that you don't understand. For your word tells us that you will work things for the good of your people who are called according to your purposes. Romans 8, 28. I'm trusting that, God, because this doesn't feel like it. Five years of writing my dissertation did not feel like God knew what he was doing. And you seek. You seek help from a professional. Your pastor, a Stephen minister, a Christian counselor, or another healthcare professional that will be able to assist you. You don't need to go alone. You shouldn't go alone. You need to express, you need to say to a confidential source, the pain that is suffering you. If you don't say it, it will eat away inside of you like a cancer, like an acid, like leprosy, literally eating you away. You need to say it. Now, I'm not saying you need to say it out on the street corner for everybody to hear, 
but you need to find some professional help. Pastor, Stephen Minister, you know, our Stephen Ministry is an excellent program here at Our Redeemer. If you have anything that is going on in your life, I can find you a female Stephen minister, if you are a female, a male Stephen minister, if you are a male, and you can meet with them up to an hour per week for you to share and for them to listen. Because the Stephen minister will listen when everyone else in your life is done hearing. When everyone else in your life has said, I've heard it before. I know. I know. I've heard this story. A Stephen minister says, tell me again. Tell me again. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. This is a particular verse I have spoken out loud numerous times as I go through suffering in my life. Joy comes in the morning. Tomorrow's a new day. Annie got it right. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love ya tomorrow, right? Joy comes in the morning. When did God save his people from their long night in Egypt? In the morning. When does Psalm 46 say God delivers? In the morning. When did Jesus rise again? In the morning. When does God deliver us from the long nights of life? According to Lamentations 3.23, his mercies are new every morning. What is the last name the Bible gives Jesus? The bright morning star. Sometimes our suffering is deserved. Other times, not. I, I think um, there's, you know, I've got four more pages here. I think we'll just start here next week. The good news for me is I didn't have to do any prep for this Bible study. Just read my notes for 20 minutes. Uh, I guess I won't have to do any prep for next week. I think there were fewer out next week. Or is it supposed to be me? No, it's supposed to be me because you're preaching next week. Yeah. Okay. Well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Bye, people at home.